going to need a lawyer to represent them because they weren't going to be able to hold their own and get access to public government documents and do the kinds of investigations that were necessary for good government. Uh, so I wanted this person to be an ombudsman, as it was said, that, that was what I felt, that it would be the, be the people's lawyer. So when someone called up with a problem, they would answer the phone and say, here's what we got to do, or here's what we can do. But I'll admit that was a pretty naive idea, but, but that's what I felt that it should be. I also felt, from the very start, that the Freedom of Information Act itself is a conundrum. Because if it's public information, you shouldn't have to file a document asking for it. Uh, I'm very bothered. This is how I have a conversation when I walk into a municipal office and I'm about to do a clerk's desk. Here's this idea for a second. Via the document, your name and address, and you would please leave your papers with us so you can't leave the country. That's how I hear that one talk. That's, it's, it's a fascistic kind of thing. Like, we're warning you. You're on warning. We're going to have your name. We're going to have your address. And we're going to come after you. So I've always presented that. And, and one thing that has happened recently that, that, that's very good is a lot of government agencies now are posting things on their own websites that people can just download them. And that's the way it should be. And there should be no waiting period, automatic waiting period. Uh, I understand if you're going to enforce a law, you have to have that waiting period there. Thank 
extraordinary frustration that I think we all have that the process is not better, that the public access counselor is not faster. Um, we do everything we can, we work as fast as we can, but it's still too slow. And I don't disagree with that. Um, and I'm not going to try to spin you into thinking that we think it's all fine and perfect and doesn't need to continue to improve. I think we have a lot of improvements that we have to continue to make, both in our office and in the process, as well as in the law, as Phil commented. In terms of, you know, to give you some understanding of what we deal with, uh, we, we did go from a few people. Uh, when Attorney General Manning created the Public Access Council initially as a non-statutory kind of voluntary process, we had a lawyer and then a second lawyer and one staff person and then a second staff person. We have since gone from there to a full bureau of folks. At the moment today, we have nine attorneys and three staff. We have a number of attorney openings. I think we will have 10 by next week. We hope to add two or three more. One of the biggest challenges we face in the Attorney General's office, across the entire office, and this is certainly true of the Public Access Bureau, is extraordinary turnover. We have seen from January 2010 to the present, uh, just a little under a 70% turnover in Assistant Attorneys General. That's extraordinary. Uh, and it's true of the Public Access Bureau as well as the other litigation divisions in the office. Um, if you're reading about the state budget and wondering how it impacts, you know, I'm sure that you all hear about how it impacts social service agencies, uh, the provision of critical services, in the state's law firm, which is our office, it has a direct impact. Um, our very low salaries have created extraordinary turnover. And that's hard. It's hard when we finally get fully staffed, literally minutes later, we're losing somebody. And so it's a constant turnover. And what that means in the Public Access Bureau is that the very heavy workload has delays caused as cases and matters get passed to new attorneys when there's turnover. Um, that's not an excuse. Uh, we are trying to do better. We have a lot more to do to do better, but I want to give you a realistic perspective of what we deal with. So with that, that is the background. We get, last year we got uh, 3,426 Uh They range, and sometimes you can't tell when you initially, when initially comes in whether it's going to be pretty straightforward or very complex. So that also takes some time. On the positive side, I will say that we are issuing Trust me, your frustration that more opinions are not my name is shared by our office. Uh, you're more than welcome to vent to me. I will have a sympathetic ear, and I won't, again, I'm not going to disagree with you or try to convince you that all is perfect. Um, the plus side is that we did issue more binding opinions last year, and I think our binding opinions in terms of, while everybody would prefer that we issue more of them, I do think we are selecting wisely the ones that we do issue. We are tackling some of the more difficult issues in FOIA. We're trying to tackle some of the areas where there is literally no case law. And so you see lawyers from public bodies kind of floundering. So we've dealt, uh, as you know, with the issue of members of public bodies sending emails or texts from their personal devices and of those public documents. I think that's an issue that's going to continue to be extremely controversial. I think it's an issue just started to touch the surface of, uh, and we have a lot more work to do on that. We've tackled uh, the question of the very large exemption called 7-1-F, the draft exemption, the deliberative process exemption, whatever you want to call it. That is still an extraordinarily broad exemption. We're not going to be able to make it less broad to a certain extent, but we did issue a line of opinion that talked about how factual, statistical data is not exempt under 7.1F just because it's wrapped in a document that may have opinions in it, may be a draft document, doesn't mean you can exclude the statistical data. I think that's an important issue. We dealt with 7.1N, which is the employee, the discipline, employee discipline uh, area. There was a fantastic court decision earlier this week, uh, the Calvin case versus the Chicago Police Department. That opinion really essentially we're excited. It's basically the same reasoning of the binding opinion that we issued earlier in the year. So we're thrilled to have a case on that. Uh, and glad that our reasoning was on target, at least as far as the First District Appellate Court was concerned. 
Um, we delved into the area of can a public body shut somebody off and say, you know, you can get these documents through discovery and litigation. Can you essentially dodge FOIA by sending someone over to discovery? We dealt with that issue, and that's one that I'm not sure uh, the media sees that a lot, but we know that individual citizens get that a lot from public bodies. And we also dealt with this question in another area that needs a lot more fleshing out, which is, is it, if a public body has hired a private entity on a contract to perform some government function, can they decline to turn over the documents by saying, well, they're in the possession of our contractor. We don't have those documents. Those are the contractor's documents. And we try to start to get into that in a binding opinion. I think those are all areas that are very difficult. There's very little law in those areas. So we are trying to you know, chip away at some of those and issue binding opinions in some of those areas. We have a lot of work to do uh, in that regard. Uh, I commented on the, the First District Appellate Court decision on police uh, complaints. That was a big victory for transparency advocates. We also saw a very important decision out of the First District Appellate Court recently addressing the issue of attorney's fees uh, and trying to clarify that the rewrite in 2010 actually does make it easier to get attorney's fees if you're a FOIA plaintiff. Uh, it, the first district disagreed with a second district case that had, uh, which was really a terrible decision, that had actually taken us backwards on attorney's fees. And I know that's an extremely important issue for folks. Because we do believe at the AG's office that the Public Access Council is just one route. There is still the route of litigation, a number of media organizations and individuals and nonprofit organizations choose to go directly to court. That's terrific. They should we need more case law on FOIA. The more people are going to court, while it's unfortunate, we wish they got their document without having to go to court, we do think more case law helps everyone. And so the issue of plaintiffs being able to get attorney's fees is one that we view as critical. We want to encourage people to file FOIA lawsuits when they believe that's necessary and to have the incentive to do that, to defend their rights, assert their rights. So I do think we are seeing some good court decisions. We've seen some good binding opinions, but again, as you can tell, the theme of my remarks is we, we do realize that we have a long way to go and a lot more work to do. And responding to Phil's last point, it, it's true, we have more legislative work to do. Unfortunately, he's absolutely correct. We have spent, certainly in the Attorney General's office, we have spent the last few years primarily playing defense. Uh, I get, at any given week during the legislative session, I get from our legislative staff a list of FOIA bills that can be anywhere from two or three to 20 or 30. Some of them are okay bills. Uh, we're not entirely sure what they're aiming at, and so we ask our staff to go talk to the sponsors and see what their focus is, and if the bill is moving, we try to offer to help rewrite it. If their goal is to make FOIA stronger, we offer to help rewrite the bill and help them push the bill. If their goal is to make, in our view, again, I'm speaking for us, not for the sponsors, if their goal is to weaken FOIA or the Open Meetings Act, we oppose those bills, but it's tough. There's a lot of them. Um, I would, the one I would point to this session is there is a bill, it hasn't started moving yet, but the session really is in full gear, so I'm not sure what it'll move. It would exempt 911 call recordings from disclosure, which anyone in the media knows is a, is a very significant problem. Um, we at the AG's office think that the current exemptions, which allow some redaction, and the current law enforcement exemptions are more than broad enough to address, frankly, probably too broad, to address any concern that law enforcement might have or that prosecutors might have, any legitimate concern. So that really worries us. Um, we're not sure if it's going to move, but this is, it's early in the session. Inevitably, I will start to see a longer and longer list of FOIA bills as the session goes on. Um, so we are, unfortunately, spending way too much time on the defensive. And that's, that's a problem because it means that we're not putting our attention Towards strengthening uh, FOIA and the Open Meetings Act, and I wholeheartedly agree with Phil that there's, there's a lot more to do on that. So, with that, I'm happy to answer questions.
My question is about the Open Meetings Act. So in the act, it says it's a Class C misdemeanor for violations of the Open Meetings Act. Uh, two parts. Can you tell us what you would constitute to be a egregious enough violation for that to be taken to that criminal level for a board? And um, also, can you give us any anecdotes of some boards that behaved egregiously enough to have be prosecuted for that? Um, I should start by saying we don't have to it's not the Attorney General's fault to prosecute a case that would be a state's um, So, 
really the question's better asked to the two states attorneys who, as an aside, are advisors to their county. So, um, be asking them to prosecute their own the county board that they advise. Um, I mean, I think when we've spoken to states attorneys, what they would want to see is truly evidence of intent, of deliberate avoidance of the law. So they would be looking for knowledge of the law, essentially, or at least a general sense of what the law requires and then deliberate intent to avoid it. So, you know, we have anecdotes of instances where you can certainly shake your head and say, what was the board thinking? Instances where boards have decided to change their regular meeting place for a particular meeting and meet in a much smaller space, farther away from where they normally meet. That strikes me as one where you'd say, really? That was a little strange. Why would you suddenly move to a smaller room farther away? Um, we've certainly seen instances where boards have made deliberate decisions not to disclose certain information during the open portion of the meeting. Um, but in some cases, we have a binding opinion, for instance, where a board went into executive session to address employee discipline, which is appropriate. They made a decision to terminate an employee. They have to actually, they can discuss that decision in executive session, but they have to vote in open session. They decided in open session not to disclose the employee's name. You can ask a question there. Uh, I think a state's attorney looking into that would want to know, did that board seek any guidance from the attorney? Who was, what did they think they were doing? Were they deliberately making a decision not to disclose the name? What was the motivation? I think you'd want to see those things. I mean, we see, at any given time, we see a lot of anecdotes of fumbling and just really a lack of knowledge or a lack of attention and care being paid to this, to compliance with the law. We also see anecdotes that really do make you scratch your head and wonder what were they thinking. But I think a state attorney would need to look a little beyond that and feel comfortable that he or she was looking at a situation where there was a deliberate decision to ignore the law. And your office wouldn't automatically refer it, the requester or the citizen would have to go to the state's attorney? We could refer it to a state's attorney. The time clock on a, on a criminal prosecution is very short. Um, usually the state's attorney, the more egregious Open Meetings Act violations, usually the state's attorney is aware of.
Um, you probably have a much better sense of this with the binding uh, opinions, but I'm, I'm curious, um, in instances where the office has said the information should be turned over, that the law provides that this information should be turned over, uh, do you have a sense whether it is binding or non binding opinions, if that actually happens? We have a sense of the binding opinions that it does. Um, we, we don't have a very good sense of the non binding opinions, and frankly, that is an area where if we have more manpower, we should be tracking that. And we're not, uh, and that's to me a gap in the knowledge and information we have about our own process. Uh, we don't have a very clear sense. We get some anecdotal information, people telling us they got their documents. We get lots of other anecdotal information, people saying the, the public body will be off again, but we don't know enough to get beyond the anecdotes. And that, I, I consider that a very significant gap in you know, the data that we have and our ability to report on how it's working. If I can ask a quick follow-up. In terms of the non-binding appendix, uh, have you learned in some sense that it's at least helpful for people, uh, mm -hmm. that they can share that, and it, in some ways it helps you? We do. I mean, there, is, there are a lot of success stories. There are a lot of instances where people do. We are aware of a number of agencies and a number of public bodies that respond and give out the documents in response to them. Thank you. 
one question. Yes, uh, um, whether or not uh, we're looking at to see some of these uh, public bodies are, are their members are agency heads. So we have a big opportunity in that moment. Um, I think you raise a number of very good concerns. That, uh, your first point about what is being done to educate public bodies about this, and I'm sure you've all experienced this, the major response is to give a PDF instead of to give the document so word. We see that problem all the time. We see it with the agencies that we have to represent in FOIA litigation. And we try to encourage them to just give the document over in the, the form it's created, in the form it's maintained, and if that's what the requester wants. But it is a struggle. It's a little similar to the, the comment Joe made earlier, just in general, about data. It's very, it's, it really is a challenge to get public bodies to realize it's all going to be okay if you just give it over as a Word document or an Excel document. You're, we have difficulty with that. We try when we're speaking to them to encourage them to do that, but it's not easy. Your, the issue you raise about the head of the public body is a good one. We would certainly be open to a change that would, if the sense uh, among those of you who are using FOIA all the time is that it would help the process to force the agency head to sign off, I would certainly be very open to that. I mean, our goal in the rewrite, I think, was to get rid of the appeal process to the agency head, which was how the previous statute was worded, because the sense was that that was not meaningful, that it added time and that there were, it was very rare that an agency head disagreed with the line staff that answered the FOIA initially. But to bring in kind of accountability, we would be very open to that. I, I would have to be guided by those of you who use FOIA all the time. I can't think of your last. Oh, you're, the egregious comment on the Open Meetings Act. I, I would agree that what you're describing is months and months and months of meetings without posting, without minutes. That's pretty egregious. I, I don't know the specific facts of that instance. It, it is, you know, in our view, everyone who sits on a board or a commission should be trained in the Open Meetings Act. Uh, we have appointees from our office that sit on assorted boards and commissions, and we try to get them focused on their need to be trained in the Open Meetings Act, take the training, know what the act means, even if they're just one of 12 board members they need to know. But that's a, that's, you know, an ongoing struggle. Going back to Steve's question. So if they maintain the document in Excel, and you've asked for it in Excel, 
They need to give it to you in Excel. Again, I understand enforcement is difficult. All, many people just kind of throw their hands up and live with the PDF because it's faster than trying to enforce it, and I do understand that. But compliance with FOIA requires that they give it to you in the format they maintain it, if that's right. And if that's feasible for some reason. Okay, that's question. You mentioned that you, you said your staff really gave some providing decisions. Could you give us over your back how many you've done with the process? What resources, who is really getting senior and senior? Um, so, a binding opinion can be taken up on administrative review by the, the side of the dispute that doesn't like the binding opinion. So, I don't, and I apologize, I don't have the statistics. I would probably say over 50%, 60 or 70% of our binding opinions do end up in administrative review. It's an easier form of litigation than starting a lawsuit from scratch because what it means is the court is reviewing our decision. So the record is already created, there won't be discovery, uh, it should be just litigation that proceeds through briefing. We are in each of those cases to defend our mining opinions. That's handled by the litigation side of the office, not by the public access lawyers, although they're heavily involved in that. They do get to edit the briefs, their input is sought. The public access counselor, uh, Sarah Pratt, is an extremely experienced litigator, so her input is sought on those. But depending on what city you can bring an administrative review in either Sangamon County or Cook County, depending on which city there are most lawyers in our offices in Springfield and Chicago who handle those cases. Um, they can be relatively junior lawyers, but their briefs are subject to fairly extensive review um, to make sure that we're saying things that are consistent with the binding opinion, to make sure that they're not FOIA experts, to make sure that they're not missing something. A number of those cases have gone up on appeal, and we now have uh, at least two or three appellate lawyers who are experts in FOIA. Okay, guys, uh, so that'll wrap up the questions.